Up next, we have Willow Brew talking about life insurance, <laughs> life insurance, externalizing risk for improvement and profit. Welcome to the stage, Willow. Hey friends, how's it going? Oh God. Microphones, they're magic. Am I close enough to it? Yeah, you're good. Thank you, Steen. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You're not even on stage. <laughs> You're always on stage in our hearts. Eh? It's true. It's true. All right, so I'm Willow, and I'm going to talk about um, risk, of course. That's the point of our evening. Um, and that there are many ways to mitigate risk. There are things like liability and contracts. There are protection rackets. Um, and there are mutual defense treaties, for better or worse. Um, and risk is not often good. But sometimes we set up a navigation of risk in a way that allows us to also make gains. Uh, we can cooperate. We can engage in mutual aid. We can prepare for the future in how we think about risk. One of the ways we systematize all that is through insurance. It's sort of like placing a bet. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about four different kinds today. Uh, property insurance, fire, life, and climate. Initially, I was asked to just cover life insurance, and then I fell down an internet hole, and I was like, but there are so many different holes. Oh, it's amazing. Um, so, and now you're all stuck with it. So here we go. <laughs> all right. So um, insurance is, is also about how we could set up to make gains while mitigating risk, or how it's just about capitalism eating its tail. Insurance takes both of these versions. Um, these are stick figures borrowing from their future selves. I don't know if you can tell that or not. There's actual stick figures later um, drawing under pressure. OK. Uh, <laughs> ships. Uh, so let's talk property insurance first. Uh, most of the visible history of insurance stems from agreements between individuals for merchandise on ships. So when you're sending something out and you don't have quite enough to cover it, um, you want to get insurance on the goods and also get a loan for what's on there. Um, and a lot of the practices around this emerged from Lloyd's Coffee House. Coffee houses aren't just from San Francisco. Um, they also happened in uh, London and other places too. Okay, so, but then you're just having one, per, it's like a one-to-one -one agreement between those people for the insurance. Um, but at some point in the first millennium BC, uh, the inhabitants of Rhodes created what's called a general average. And it meant that a bunch of people could put a bunch of different stuff on a, on a ship, and then a bunch of other people could help insure it, and it would all kind of work out in the end. Um, <laughs> and uh, the collected premiums would be used to reimburse any merchant whose goods were jettisoned during transport, whether due to storm or sinkage. It was a way of collateralizing. It's where uh, you pledge something in exchange for something else. So you say, if this stuff doesn't come back, then you get my house, right? And so you're you're mitigating risk by promising something in the future. But then this thing was happening where people would just sail away with your stuff that you would help pay for. And so um, they helped mitigate that risk by making sure that the person who was accountable for it had to stay on shore. Uh, and the repayment was based on the return of the goods, not of the ship. Because sometimes they would put the goods on a different ship, and then it was like, the, the, it, legalities are fun. Um, and so this was a way of externalizing the risk more and more. You're pushing it outward onto other people. The 1840s is when we started having life insurance for non-white people. Um, but it was still about property insurance because we're dicks. Uh, and the payout for these deaths went to the, the, the holders rather than to the family. Um, many insurance companies, which we still use today, had these policies because they've been around for long enough and because slavery was not that long ago. Um, and of course, we all still experience benefits of this. That's why we're all on top all the time. And it's horrible, and we need to think about that on a regular basis. Downers. Okay, so, um, segue time. Uh, this guy is Marcus Linicus Crashus. 
he supposedly had a fire brigade in Caesar's time, and he would put out the fire if you paid him. Like, he would show up, and he'd be like, give me money, and I'll put it out. And if you didn't give him money, he'd be like, fuck you, and no other fire brigade is coming here. And then he would offer to buy the burned property from you, and then he would rebuild it with slaves. Um, and so his name of uh, Marcus Linicus Crassus uh, is also the same root word as crass. Um, and uh, hooray. Cool, all right. <sighs> so, um, so fire insurance. Uh, we mostly think about fire insurance in terms of the Great London Fire. Uh, so what happened after the Great London Fire is that some houses would be insured, like they would pay for the fire brigade to show up. Um, and that meant that they would only save, fires, uh, save houses that were insured by them. Uh, and, and the municipality was like, this doesn't seem nice. Like, there are a lot of houses that are being left behind. And so then uh, people would pay into the, the municipality, and the municipality would then cover the insurance companies and the brigades, or they would cover the brigades. Um, but they would still mostly only save the houses that were covered by the insurance. It was still not great. And it sounds an awful lot like healthcare in America now. <laughs> Too soon? It's ongoing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Seth, this slide is for you. I hope you recognize the, the reference on it. Uh, up in the corner, it's, it's zombie ben, ben Franklin from Scott the Disposable Assassin. It's the best comic. Anyway, okay, so Ben Franklin popularized this in the U.S. in uh, the fire insurance in 1752. Um, and he did something new, which was instead of just dealing with the fires as they happened, um, he also set it up so that they would refuse to insure buildings that were at too high a risk. Say, hey, like, this is entirely made out of wood. Maybe we don't want to cover this one. Um, ships started following similar patterns at the same time of noticing how much risk they were putting themselves at. Um, this is my favorite stick figure in here. Um, so it caused people to be smarter about what they were doing, which moves all of society forward, right? We were building better houses if we did all this. So, science. Yes. We're improving what we do by paying attention. I think that's science. <laughs> Seems legit. Okay, so <laughs> insurance is a way to externalize risk in order to make gains. Um, there's also a story in here that I don't have time for, which is about automatic sprinklers, um, which were patented, but they languished because no one was using them, and they were too expensive to install, and then an insurance company was like, we'll reduce your, uh, your premium if you install these things. And so it's a way of uh, moving safety forward without necessarily using other government uh, mechanisms which is rad. I also like government mechanisms, but maybe you don't. Okay. Um, so everyone wins on these. Let's jump back to life insurance. Um, the first company to offer life insurance for white people was the Amicable Society for a Perpetual Assurance Office. <laughs> Mouthful. Uh, it looked more like Social Security, where you would like pay into a bank than it would pay out when you died to, to your family, um, than life insurance as we know it now. Uh, it led to life tables, which are also the beginning of statistics. In 1666, more science. <laughs> yes, math. They're the same thing, not really, okay. Uh, <laughs> Yes, thank you. Uh, it's, it, there's, notice there's a 200-year gap between when we started insuring white people and when we started insuring non-white people. Like, that's significant. That's not okay. Um, so deciding whether or not to take a risk was still, wor still based on a gut feeling, though, of whether or not you insured someone's life. Uh, so the 1760s is when life tables were finally mathful, I didn't know how else to put that, uh, enough to be useful for predicting balance between a person's age and their activities before they, um, that would make it worthwhile to pay out at their death. Uh, for these, there were uh, mutuals where they didn't care who you were so long as you could pay, which is the most capitalist phrase I've ever heard. Uh, <laughs> But they didn't have external stakeholders, so there wasn't any fiduciary responsibility. Um, it gets to one of the benefits of capitalism, that we have an easier exchange uh, to act with with more autonomy and choice when we externalize how we value things. 
Let's talk for a very brief moment about uh, climate change insurance. It's a thing that we could be doing. Um, we could be thinking about those houses that were catching fire and what is the baseline of what we insure and what we don't. We could be using that to push humanity forward in how we think about safety and risk. Um, but most of the groups that cover property aren't thinking that long term. Uh, and so as our climate becomes more and more extreme, they're actually not seeing those short-term gains that would bring them profit for their, those that they're fiduciarily responsible for to prepositions, however it works. Okay, so, but insurance I think is actually in a unique position to deal with climate change given the ways that it behaves as an institution. Um, so I would like to see that, otherwise it's, we could have science, but instead we're just like, oh my God, everything is on fire. Um, yeah, less than 0.5% of assets invested in the world's 80 largest insurers are in low carbon investments that provide solutions to climate change, despite the insurance sector being highly exposed to its financial risks. Uh, and nine out of 10 investment strategies in the sector make the Paris Agreement goals currently unattainable. <laughs> yeah. All right, so in summary, <laughs> um, what we're willing to insure and what we think we can exchange money and risk into the future for a return for a more stable now um, is not seen as worthwhile with climate change and we need to really change how we think about that. Um, it takes an active effort along multiple vectors to address the problems in front of us. Um, it's not just about these different forms of insurance, there are also other options available to us in how we cooperate to build a better future. Um, and I think I'm just gonna leave it there. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>